This video is sponsored by Skillshare. What is going on everybody? My name is John Solo. I'm 26 years old and I'm not afraid to admit that I hate spiders. I hate them. I think they're scary. I think they're gross and I don't really care that they get rid of other bugs because I'm pretty sure that's what my taxes are for. That being said, not everybody feels the same way as I do. There's people down in Louisiana who eat spiders probably and seemingly every ancient culture from the Egyptians to the Greeks had a highly respected goddess who was somehow affiliated with the little beasts. There is one one spider in particular who stands out as the most famous or infamous in all of mythology and folklore though. His name is Anansi or Anansi and he's got quite the reputation. The reason for that is because he's what's called a trickster hero. Similar to Maui and Loki and even more similar to Br'er Rabbit, he often uses his cleverness and storytelling abilities in morally questionable ways to get what he wants. And while there's no doubt a ton of you who know of Anansi from Neil Gaiman's American Gods where the storytelling element of his character along with his African roots are heavily emphasized, he has made appearances in more kid-friendly shows as well. In Static Shock, he's a superhero whose trickery and storytelling skills make him a master of illusion, and on Sesame Street, he shows up as a cute little spider who teaches life lessons to the audience. And while those portrayals are each fantastic in their own special ways, this show is all about the stories that inspired those stories and how they got here. So today, we're looking at the messed up origins of a Nancy. Before we get into it though, I do want to say thanks to the sponsor who made this episode possible, our friends at Skillshare. For those who don't know, Skillshare is an online learning community that offers thousands of classes to its millions of members who are taking the next step on their creative journey by learning all kinds of new skills. Their platform has classes on illustration, graphic design, photography, creative writing, and these classes are taught by real experts with years of experience in their respective fields. Premium members get unlimited access to said classes that offer hands-on projects and feedback from a community of millions who are on the same journey you are. One particular class I have to recommend for anyone getting started on YouTube is taught by one of my favorite creators, Marquez Brownlee. He breaks down his entire creative process from deciding on his topic to writing a script to planning the cinematography. And while his production value may be significantly higher than people like you and I, he didn't start out that way. And there are a lot of strategies in here that even beginners can apply to make their production process easier and more successful. One of the best parts about Skillshare is that it was designed with learning in mind, meaning there are no ads and new premium classes get added all the time, so your journey doesn't ever have to end. Skillshare is also super affordable with an annual membership costing less than $10 a month, and the first 1,000 of you who click the link in the description will get a free one-month trial so you can start your creative journey today. Now before we get into the stories about Anansi, let's talk about where he comes from and the several different, often contradictory versions of him that exist. While we don't know who's responsible for the creation of Anansi, folklore experts have traced his birthplace to Africa, specifically with the Ashanti people of Ghana in Western Africa, where the word Anansi directly translates to spider. Like a number of other stories I talk about on this channel, Anansi stories, which are sometimes referred to as Anansom or spider tales, were passed on orally for centuries before ever being written down. As a result, the character's physical description and temperament can be completely different from story to story. Depending on what tale you're reading, Anansi could behave and be described in a number of ways, as a man, as a spider, or a terrifying combination of those which I now see every time I close my eyes. Interestingly though, no matter what physical form he's given, it never seems to have much of an impact on the plot. Him being a spider could change the setting from a village in Africa to the jungle, but I never came across a story in my research Research where he solved the problem as a spider in a way that he couldn't have if he was human. And I think that's because these stories aren't meant to focus on physical attributes. Instead, they choose to emphasize his personality and the cleverness he uses to defeat both physically and metaphysically more powerful opponents by outsmarting them with cunning, creativity, and trickery. So why make him a spider at all, you ask? Well, according to the annotated African-American folktales, this stems from him being a storyteller. Similar to a spider, a storyteller spins a web that can entrap those who aren't careful. Careful. I also think that spiders are a good representation of something that is deceptively dangerous. Yes, they appear weak and small, but they can be deadly if underestimated, and that's one of the few things that's consistent about Anansi in almost every story. Another quality of his that shifts from tale to tale is his status as a god. Sometimes he's described as such, and other times he's a mortal man. So what's the deal with that? Well, the fact that he isn't clearly stated to be a god in every single tale shows that he definitely didn't have a place in the Ashanti's religious practices. 
is. That, combined with the facts that there are no shrines to him, no evidence of sacrifices being made in his honor, and no record of his ever being worshipped. I would say that you can think of him as a demigod like Maui, a fellow trickster hero who also wasn't prey to, but was highly respected by those who shared his stories and was a very integral part of their culture. We'll get into how all that also applies to Anansi in the analysis section, but first I want to share with you some of the trickster's most iconic stories. So as you would expect from a figure as iconic as Anansi, he's actually featured in a ton of fables, way more than we can fit in just one episode. I've already decided I'm going to have multiple episodes about him in a new series that's launching on the channel in October, but we'll talk more about that some other time. As for this episode, there are four stories I want to cover, every one of them a foundational fable. What that means is that these stories each explain some kind of real world phenomenon, like where wisdom came from and why children who misbehave get the whip. Yes, that's a real story we're talking about today. Before we dive in though, I do want to let you know that despite the popularity of these stories, I had a hard time finding art for some of them, so just a heads up, you're going to be seeing a lot of my face in this section. I'm sorry. The first fable we're looking at is titled How the Sky God Stories Came to Be Known as Spider Stories. It opens with Anansi, referred to as Kwaku Anansi, which means Father Spider, approaching the Sky God Nyankopan and saying he wants to buy his stories. Kind of weird to think that someone could buy a story since it's not a material good that only one person can possess at a time, but the price the Sky God assigns them shows you how much they're actually worth to the culture they belong to. He says he'll only give Anansi his stories if the spider can bring him a python, a leopard, a fairy or dwarf in some versions, and a swarm of hornets. And the spider says, no problem. I'll even throw in my mom for good measure. That's how you know when someone you're bartering with means business. When you name an impossible price and they one up you by offering to throw in their mom as a free gift. Well, as hilarious and unnecessary as her role in the transaction is, she doesn't put up much of a fight when Anansi tells her he's shipping her off. Then he and his wife Aso set out to collect the animals using the trickery that Anansi is known for. For example, to catch the python, they tricked him into comparing his length to a long tree branch. Then when his defenses were lowered, Anansi tied some web around his neck and strangled him. To catch the hornets, Anansi threw water at them so they would think it was raining, then seek protection by flying into a gourd he was holding, which he then Sealed up. You would think that catching the leopard would present a bit of a challenge, but not for Anansi. He simply dug a pit outside of its lair, and after it fell in, he offered to help it up. Then, while pulling him out of the pit, he once again took advantage of his victim's defenses being lowered, and with his free hand took a knife and stabbed him in the head. Fucking savage. Now, some of you are going to recognize the way he catches the fairy from my episode on Song of the South. Basically, he carves a doll called an Akua child, lathers it in tree sap, and places it in a spot where the fairies typically hang out. He then tricks the fairy he's targeting into getting mad at the doll and smacking it, and when she smacks it, she gets stuck to the sap. After that, Anansi ties her up, takes her to the sky god along with the other beasties he killed and captured, and his mother, and the god has no choice but to honor his side of the deal. He not only gives Anansi his stories, but says he has total ownership over them. So from that point onward, they would be referred to as spider stories. Our next tale is titled How Wisdom Came Into the World, and I'm glad I read it because I always wondered. In this fable, Anansi is again referred to as Father Anansi and sort of treated as a god, though it's never explicitly stated. He's said to possess all the wisdom in the world, so people seek him out on a daily basis for advice and guidance. One day, the human race does something to offend Anansi, or in other versions, he's just bored, so he decides to punish them by gathering up all the wisdom he shared and sealing it in a pot. The next morning, he tied the pot around his neck and went deep into a jungle to hide it in a particular tree, only he was having a hard time climbing said tree while the pot was around his neck. After watching his dad struggle for a while, his son, who had followed him out in the jungle, says, Dad, why don't you hang the pot against your back so it doesn't get in the way when you climb? Which makes me question how wise Anansi really was. Actually, it made Anansi himself second guess it. He thought he had all the world's wisdom sitting in his jar, but here his son was with even more. In anger, Anansi threw his pot on the ground, shattering it into pieces and allowing his wisdom to spread across the world for the the rest of mankind to use. Personally, I'd rather have wisdom from the guy who wasn't trying to climb a tree with a pot tied around his chest, but I don't think that's the point of the story.
So far, we've seen two versions of a Nancy. The first one was questionable, but overall pretty neutral. The animals he killed were predators. Fairies can be dangerous as well. I'd say the most concerning part is his volunteering to trade away his mom, but she didn't seem to mind. In the second story, we saw him get a little greedier and a little less rational, but in the end, he did the right thing and the world was a better place because of it. While I doubt you'll be surprised to hear that in this story, titled How It Came About That Children Were First Whipped, he's the most savage we've seen him. In this story, there's a famine and to ensure their survival, Nancy builds a little settlement with his wife and four children whose names I'm not even gonna take a swing at. Every day, he would gather wild yams to boil and eat with his family. But one day while in the jungle, he finds a magic dish that can fill up with soup on command. Only instead of sharing it with his family, he hides it in their attic so he can have it all to himself. The problem with that plan is he starts skipping their family dinners and his son Entakuma notices that he's not losing any weight despite not eating. So he does a little snooping and discovers his father's magic plate in the attic. And I'll say that at first he did the right thing with it and what a Nancy should have done. He summoned some soup and shared it with his family. What happened next though was a huge mistake because this magic plate had one rule and that was to never touch a gun wad or a little gourd cup. Not sure why, probably something from its childhood. Well, Antikuma knew this rule because the plate straight up told him and he did it anyway. So that night when Anansi went to eat some soup, the plate wouldn't fill up for him and he knew right away his son was to blame. It just so happens that the next day, Anansi finds a beautiful whip that he learns the hard way is also magic because he says to show him what it can do and it starts beating him senseless. He endures this for way too long until a nearby bird tells him the magic shutdown phrase, cool and easy now, and then Anansi comes up with a plan. He not so subtly puts the whip in the attic where his nosy son discovers it. Then when his family gathers around to inspect it, the whip starts beating all of them senseless. At this point, Anansi peeks his head into the attic and just watches for a while, enjoying his revenge while his wife and children are given wealth after wealth. Eventually, he says the magic phrase to stop the whip though, and after scolding his family, he chops the weapon up and scatters it across the land. And apparently that is how whipping came to be a punishment for children. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't blame Anansi for wanting to treat himself to some soup or being furious with his son for ruining the magic plate, but if he had just shared it to begin with, the whole problem could have been avoided and no one would have had to be beaten. Once again, we're seeing the selfishness of Anansi come out just a little bit more. Our fourth and final story explains how contradiction came to the Ashanti and why people hate being contradicted. It opens by introducing us to a man who's named, get this, hates to be contradicted. Yeah, kind of boxing your kid in a corner when you give him a name like that, don't you think? Well, you can guess what hates to be contradicted's main personality trait was and which of the five emotions was the one running his controls. Every time someone called him out for lying, even when he told clearly made up stories, he would kill them. And Anansi didn't like that. So he made up a crazy story of his own and shared it with hates to be contradicted. He said that his okra plants are so tall that when they're ripe, he joins 77 long hooked poles together and still can't reach them, so he's forced to lay on his back and use his penis instead. I'm just gonna let that one sit for a second. Hates to be contradicted, or the mad hater, as I'll call him, says he'll come to Anansi's farm the next day to check out his process because apparently he's got to see how long this dude's D really is. Well, when Anansi gets home, he tells his children about the mad hater and says, When he comes by tomorrow, tell him I broke my dick in seven places and had to go to the blacksmith to get it fixed also make some spicy stew for dinner. I'll be honest, after reading the whole story, I still don't know why that had to be his excuse for not being home or why he couldn't be home when the guy showed up anyway, but the stew ends up being used for a pretty interesting purpose. The mad hater joins them for dinner that night and a single bite of the extremely spicy stew causes him so much pain that he wants to die. He begs Anansi, who had returned from getting his dick fixed, for some water, but Anansi replies he can only use water from the bottom of the pot because the rest doesn't belong to him, and if he takes some of the wrong water, a tribal dispute might start. The mad hater, who's sweating profusely and beating the table at this point, yells that Anansi is lying, and upon hearing those words, the spider responds, Children, kill this man. At that, the mad hater responds, Whoa, whoa. 
why are you gonna kill me? And Anansi says, because you're a hypocrite. You hate to be contradicted and kill those who dare say you're wrong, but you contradict others freely. So to give you a taste of your own medicine, we have to kill you. And they do. Anansi and all his children throw the mad hater to the floor and beat him to death. It was really a great bonding experience for them. After he was dead, Anansi cut the hypocrite's body into little pieces and scattered them everywhere, which it turns out is why people today hate to be contradicted. Aren't you glad you finally know that now? So next time someone disagrees with you, try to avoid channeling your inner mad hater and hear him out. You might learn something. So the four fables I just broke down can all be found in the Annotated African American Folk Tales, a book I highly recommend for anyone interested in learning more about an underrepresented part of the folklore world. But these stories, along with many others from African American folklore, were first collected in the early 1900s by William Barker, an American missionary who published his collection in 1917. The other guy credited with collecting the bulk of Anansi stories we know today is Robert Rattray. He was a British ship captain and anthropologist who specialized in African studies and learned these stories directly from the Akanashanti people in the 1930s. Another way these stories were collected though was sadly through the slave trade, which brought a number of different African cultures together in the Caribbean and the Americas. As a result, variants of Anansi stories featuring similar but different trickster characters have popped up, like Aunt Nancy can be found in the Uncle Rima stories that Joel Chandler Harris collected in the Southern US. So while Anansi was a very important figure over in Africa and was how they explained, scrutinized, and questioned the world around them, you could argue that he was even more sacred to those in the Caribbean and America. Because while his stories may have changed form as they were passed on over hundreds of years and across thousands of miles, he was still a symbol of the culture of their ancestors, a culture they were ripped away from and never got to experience for themselves. And this folk hero, as questionable as his methods were, showed that it was possible to succeed even when the odds are stacked against you. A spider was able to choke out a python because he was clever, not because he was bigger, stronger, or had more power in the relationship. All he needed was some time to think and he could solve any problem. And I believe that message resonated with the people who were stolen away from their homes in the dead of night and dropped into a completely new world they had no understanding of. Not only was he a symbol of hope and rebellion, but he allowed their culture to be kept alive. And that, I think, is as good a spot as any to wrap this episode up. But don't fret, Solo fam. We will be talking about Anansi again very soon. I don't want to give away too much just yet, but I do want to post an update video soon because there is a lot going on behind the scenes here on the channel, and it's been way too long since we've talked about it. For now, though, let me know your thoughts on Anansi. Where do you know him from, and how do these stories compare with the version you're familiar with? If you haven't already, be sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons. Not only do they help the channel a lot, but you'll get more content like this delivered to your sub box every week. To those who want to stay as updated as possible on Messed Up Origins news, follow me on social media. But if you've already got too many humans on your timeline, follow this little mush bag right here because he's almost as big of a troublemaker as a Nancy is. Do you like to steal laundry and run away with it and get it covered in drool so it has to be washed all over again? I'll see you all again next week when we dive into the messed up origins of another famous nursery rhyme. Until then, my name is John Solo and remember, John shot first.